Standardized tests are A, important, B, biased, C, controversial, D, all of the above. This is Inside the Issues. When was the first SAT exam taken? 1885, 1926, 1927, or 1955? The answer is B, 1926. Welcome to Inside the Issues. I'm Alex Cohen, and on this episode, we are taking an in-depth look at standardized tests and their impact on Southern California. Let's start with a bit of history. At the turn of the 20th century, college presidents from 12 universities started the College Entrance Examination Board, known simply as the College Board. They created a standardized test, also known as the College Boards, and that test was first administered back in 1901. Then it consisted of essay questions on things like Greek, and Latin, and physics, and it took a whopping five days to complete. And you thought the SATs were bad, didn't you? Well, then along came the IQ test, which led to the development of the SAT, which unlike the college boards, was supposed to test a student's ability to learn rather than gauge what they already knew. The original SAT featured two math sections, several verbal sections, seven rather, that is. And since then, educators have constantly been evaluating and re-evaluating the merits of standardized testing. So here we are in 2020, and a number of folks think it's time to bid these tests farewell. Spectrum News 1's Nikki Kay has more. As the life planning director at the Vista Mar School in El Segundo, Pam Davis doesn't have to hide her feelings when it comes to standardized testing. And, you know, if I could be God and redesign the universe, no schools would require standardized tests. They're pedagogically ridiculous and a waste of students' time. And she's all too familiar with the stress students feel from those three-letter tests. We hear a lot of college admissions officers saying, oh, it's just a small piece of the pie, but in reality, it is a weed out factor and so kids know that it's incredibly high stakes and incredibly high pressure. That wasn't really a concern for someone like Calvin Keller. He's a senior now. He studied all summer from sophomore to junior year, worked with a tutor, and now he's already taken his SAT. Um, but if I was doing it now, I would definitely not want to do it because it's less to do. So that's pretty um, useful and helpful. Calvin's good at taking tests, and being a math and science guy, he sees a standardized test as a way to shine. I think it's a good thing that they're making it more optional. Um, for me, I still feel like if they were to completely get rid of it, they should have some way to um, test math or some quantitative reasoning. Well, for somebody like him who's a really strong tester, it can be very advantageous. And that's not for everyone. If you ask Pam, a three-hour test on a Saturday morning isn't a fair measure of a student's college readiness, persistence, or success. And what's more is kids who are spending a lot of time preparing for these tests are taking away from other ways they could be developing. And that's one of my biggest beefs with it, right? Like, it, how are you going to spend your time? We don't have that much time here on this earth. And are you going to spend it really, like, prepping for a three-hour test on a Saturday? Pam anticipates that if the UCs were to drop the standardized test requirement from admissions, it wouldn't be long until other schools followed suit. But yeah, I think it's part of a larger movement to recast what's important in education um, away from grades and scores and towards experiences and mastery of um, skills that are going to be needed for the 21st century. So when it comes to the diversity of their student bodies, by dropping the standardized, universities could change the standard. Our thanks to Nikki Kay for her reporting. Now, perhaps you heard Nikki say if the UCs were to drop the standardized test requirement from admissions. Yep, that is 
an actual possibility. For more on that, I'm joined now in studio by Teresa Watanabe, who covers higher education for the LA Times. It is great to have you here. Thank you. And the standardized tests, right, they're, they're global. Kids all over the world are taking them, adults too, we should note. Uh, but for the purposes of this episode, we really want to look at the impact here in Southern California. And to do that, we really got to look at the UC system. Can you talk about, I, I feel like customer is the word that comes to mind, is the UC system being a customer for these standardized tests, and maybe that's not quite right, but how important is the UC system to standardized test companies and why? The UC system is by far the largest customer for the College Board, which owns the SAT. And as a result, the um, the makers of that test had lobbied the UC for decades for them to use the test. It was developed, as you know, in 1926, but it was primarily used by East Coast elite institutions, a yeah. small number. Yeah. And so they decided to open an office in Berkeley in 1948 with the explicit purpose to try to convince the University of California to, to buy the test and to use it. Wow. And so the university does use it. What do we know about how important, because obviously, right, most people know college applications, they're looking at grades, they're looking at life experience, essays. How important are those tests? It has evolved over time. So initially, it was used in a very small minority of cases. When they started using it in 68, it was only used in about 2% of applications, and it was mainly to look at students who had low high school GPAs or who were out of state. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 79, they widened it and started using it much more broadly because they were getting so many applications, mm -hmm. they needed a way to kind of winnow the applicant pool. Yeah. Um, and today, campuses use it in very different ways. So I know one UC campus has an actual weight of 41% of an admissions decision is going to be based on that test. But 41. I know, 41. That's significant. Yes, but then there are other many other campuses that don't have a weight like that, yeah. and they use it uh, in a, to a much smaller percentage. Now, Teresa, as we've been talking about, uh, the original intent of the SAT was try to, to try to measure a student's potential. Mm -hmm. And there's been all sorts of research right. looking at how effective. Can you kind of summarize that for us, what we know in this day and age about how effective these tests are in terms of gauging student potential to learn? Well, that's like the $84,000 right. question, yeah. and it's the source of so much controversy. Um, but even the UC, the reason the UC balked at using it for so long is that they didn't think that it did actually measure a student's potential to do well in college very well. What we know from research is that the single most effective measure is high school GPA. However, the College Board, which owns the SAT, and the ACT argue, and the research does show that a combination of the test and high school GPA probably predict freshman first year GPA the best. Yeah. Um, but you know that raises the question, is that the metric you want to look at? as opposed to a graduation rate. Yeah, um, because not everyone like you, I'm amazed at so far how well you've remembered your dates and your numbers <laughs> and asked you to do that again in just a moment because one of the stories that you wrote for the Times that I just found fascinating, you kind of looked at one particular campus, UC Riverside, that is fascinating to look at. As you reported, they have the second lowest SAT scores for entering freshmen, an average of 1260. Um, what is the data there? And I'm not expecting you to remember all of the numbers on top of your head, but what did the research there reveal about how accurate of an indicator the SAT is for those particular students? So what their data showed, and they actually produced data specifically at uh, our request, mm -hmm. and their data did show that the best predictors, what, they were a combination of the SAT and the high school GPA. Yeah. However, the students who scored high GPA and a lower SAT were not that far behind. Mm. It was not a huge difference. So it kind of um, fueled the call for high school GPA as the best predictor yeah. and, and fueled the call for, well, we should drop the SAT because of all the equity issues with that. So why might potentially the UC system drop the SAT test? We're gonna dive into that with Teresa Watanabe. First, a quick break. Stay with us. Behold a real-life question from the SAT. Do you 
know the answer? It happens to be D, 10. Now, if you did or if you didn't, is that an indication of your mathematical ability or does it say more about where you grew up and what you did or didn't have access to? I am not the only one asking these questions. One thing we all know, we don't, probably don't need any more study or discussion of, is that the one thing that SAT scores predict better than anything else is your income. And we don't need any more studies. That was Cecilia Estelano, the current vice chair of the UC Board of Regents. She was speaking at a board meeting held last fall. As you heard there, she sounded a little miffed to me. Now, here to explain why, once again, we have Teresa Wantanabe of the LA Times. Uh, this has been an incredibly divisive issue with the UC system and whether or not they should be using this test. Can you kind of summarize it for us? Give us the Cliff's Notes. Okay, well, uh, yes, it is uh, definitely a controversial issue. Um, a lot of people on the Board of Regents, such as Cecilia Estolano and Board Chair John Perez, um, are extremely concerned that the SAT is biased against um, students based on race, income, and parent education level. Mm -hmm. So they believe, and the research does show, that students who are underrepresented racial minorities or who are low income uh, just tend to score lower. and. At the same time, it's not a very uh, robust measure of how they will do in college. And so a lot of people are saying we should get rid of it, we should make it test optional. More than a thousand universities and colleges have done so, in large part because of the equity concerns. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, the College Board and the ACT and those who do support the test say that it is the one uniform yardstick that you can use, that if you go to high school grades alone, you know, Grade inflation is a reality. There yeah. is research that shows that there's higher grade inflation at affluent schools because those helicopter parents can go lobby their teachers and right. principals. Right, so be careful what you wish for, you exactly. just might get it kind right. of thing. Yes. So in a situation like this, as academic institutions often do, as I understand it, they say, well, hmm, let's study this. Let's really, you know, kind of drill down and find out what's going on. So as I understand it, just about a year ago, the UC Academic Senate launched this task force to try to evaluate standardized tests. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, what they were looking for and who was looking into this and where are they at with all of this right yeah. now? Yeah, well, the Academic Senate, which is the body that's charged with determining admissions requirements has been studying. They've been looking at all the studies. They've actually been doing some of their own research with original UC data. Mm. Um, and they're looking to see the predictive value. They're looking to see, you know, the impact on different demographics of students. And they're looking to see, are there alternatives? Yeah. I know for a while they were looking at another test called Smarter Balanced, which is used in California yeah. uh, to assess how well the K-12 students do. Uh, I don't know where that is, but they're looking at lots of alternatives. They just want to really make the right decision that they can back with evidence and research because, as you know, whatever the UC decides is going to have national and possibly international ramifications. Yeah, most definitely. And the last I think I heard or read it was somewhere around spring of this year that they thought that they might have action. I mean, it sounds like uh, Ms. Estelano was saying enough <laughs> is enough. We just need to, yeah. to get on with this. Some regions are ready to go. Yeah. Um, the Academic Senate is expected to come out with their recommendations in February. Mm. And then it will be reviewed by each of the individual nine undergraduate campuses. Yeah. And then the Board of Regents will probably take up the issue um, in May, probably, but it could be, I doubt it will be March. It'll probably be May or possibly their July meeting. Yeah. Now, let's just talk about some of the other options. You you mentioned this other test that's right. being used here in California. And, and I'm sure with any test, right, there's going to be pros and cons. And you talked about grades and, and how there can be grade inflation and maybe, I, I, I mean, I just feel like this is one of those thorny situations where there is never going to be a one-size-fits-all solution for all students. Am I yeah. missing something? No. Is there a better option out there anywhere? 
It's really tough. I mean, yeah. the options are, number one, you stick with the status quo. Yeah. You get rid of the test entirely, in which case high school grades would probably be used more heavily, but then that comes with its own set of issues. Yeah. Another option is to use a different test, which is smarter balance, and go optional or test flexible, which is that a t standardized test is required, but you, the applicant, can decide which one to submit. Yeah. Um, and a fourth option is to keep the test but limit its use. Hmm. So in 1968, when UC did start using this test, they only used it in 2% of applicant cases, and those were for a specific purpose to have a second metric for a student who may have a low high school GPA or to someone who's out of state. Yeah. So there's lots of different possibilities, and I know the Academic Senate is looking at all of them. Yeah, and what does this mean? We're going to actually hear later on in the program uh, from a representative of uh, the the people who make the ACT test but what does this mean for all of them because this is you know this is an industry that's been around for a long time it is an industry well a couple things number one even though more than a thousand colleges have gone test optional um, for instance the University of Chicago yeah. very elite private university they announced test optional a few years ago but I believe over 80 percent of applicants still submit those scores. Mm. So even if you go test optional, they're gonna still take the test. Yeah. The majority are still going to submit. Yeah. I think there's only one university in the nation uh, that actually has no test scores at all. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't submit it and they wouldn't look at it. Mm. Um, and so I don't think this is going to destroy the College Board necessarily, unless the UC says, absolutely, we're not even gonna have our students take the test. Yeah. So that would happen. But the other thing that ACT and College Board are doing is they're starting to move into the K-12 space. Maybe they're seeing the writing on the wall, and maybe they're saying, okay, we're losing our market share at the college level, so let's try to get more, more high schools to use our test. As a parent of two small children, <laughs> I just don't even want to hear it. Yes. But I do really appreciate your coming in to talk Absolutely. about all of this stuff. Great reporting that you've done Thank on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And when we return, dumping standardized tests isn't just a smart policy move. It is the only way to get around breaking the law. Well, that at least is what a number of groups right here in Southern California are arguing. We'll explain after this brief break. He was always there, tugging at Mr. Peters' elbow, making him do things that were not becoming in a man of 45. Again, real life SAT question, one that asks you to define becoming in this particular instance. And hey, if your parents are maybe big Merchant Ivory fans, that one is probably pretty easy to nail. Yep, the answer here is B, or fitting. But is this a fitting or becoming question for students who speak English as a second language or maybe grew up in a low-income household. Our next guest is likely to say no. She's attorney Lisa Holder of the Equal Justice Society, a group dedicated to changing the nation's consciousness on race through law, social science, and the arts. And Lisa, it is great to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, last month, you were part of this coalition that filed two lawsuits uh, against the UC system. And I want to talk about those lawsuits. But first, just very briefly, tell me who is in this co coalition and how you all came together. Well, the coalition includes the Equal Justice Society, and I am of counsel for the Equal Justice Society. Equal Justice Society is an Oakland-based racial justice organization that uh, educates the public on issues of implicit bias and how implicit bias affects outcomes um, and has a disparate impact on, on outcomes. Yeah. Um, and EJS, Equal Justice Society, has teamed up with Public Council, which is an LA-based um, uh, law group, civil rights law group, and several other private law firms um, it, and it, it, in, in coming together in a coalition yeah. to litigate this issue. Including Compton Unified and a couple of students. Can you tell me again, just real briefly, because I do want to talk about these suits, but who are the students involved? Because I think this part's really interesting. Yeah. We, you know, we are representing, the attorneys are representing several plaintiffs. And amongst those plaintiffs are three students. Um, in addition to the three students, there are also community organizations that 
do uh, prep, college prep, with um, low income and, and underrepresented students. But our three uh, individual plaintiffs are high school students. Yeah. You know, they're normal everyday high school students, uh, teenagers, yeah. who um, all three of them are, fr have, are from underrepresented groups. Yeah. So um, we have a student who is Latino, we have a student who is African American, we have a disabled student. Yeah. And our students are such a testament to um, hard work, dedication, excellence, and such a testament to the fact that you know, the SAT is a barrier to access to amazing students. Yeah. Okay. So explain how, because our time is limited, and I yeah. want to make sure we talk about the case itself, because we've been hearing there are plenty of people who make this argument, this is a biased test, uh, but how is it illegal? Walk me through the legal argument of these two different cases. Yeah. Okay. So now, you know, you, you, we have established on the show already that, you know, the, that it's bad education policy. The UC system is administering a, a test that has been proven by myriad studies to be biased against um, the most underrepresented and disadvantaged students and biased in favor of students who have a high parental income, affluent students. Now, it's not just a bad education policy, however. It's also unlawful policy How? because the California Constitution Equal Protection Clause um, requires that all that all, all people uh, have equal opportunity and equal access to the programs that California offers, um, and in this context, the UC system. So all high-ranking, high-qualified, highly educated and highly motivated students, regardless of race or class, should have access to this university. And there are also a spate of other anti-discrimination laws that this um, violates. So we here at Inside the Issues, we reached out to uh, the College Board, which runs the SAT, and uh, they uh, gave us a statement. And in part of that statement, they said, any objective measure of student achievement will shine a light on inequalities in our education system. In response to discussions about the use of college entrance exams by University of California, they said, and I'm quoting, criticizing test results for reflecting these inequities is like blaming a thermometer for global warming. Your response? Well, you know, it, that's, it, it's a completely inadequate response. It's a false analogy, and it's, it's somewhat nonsensical because what's actually happening is that these SATs and, AC, and, and ACT tests, they're known to be pro biased. They're proven to be biased. And the college board and the creators of the test and the purveyors of the test continue to create barriers to access. This is an active engagement here of creating a barrier to access um, to disadvantaged and underrepresented students. So it's not just shining a light on inequities. Sure, there are inequities throughout our society, racial inequities that are based on uh, his history and um, continuing disadvantages. However, this is actually putting up an additional barrier for students who already have disadvantages but I, to I have wanna, access. I want to jump in because we just have a few moments left, which okay. kills me. But I know you said if, if the UC system drops the test, you'll drop these lawsuits. But as we heard from Teresa Wantanabe, there is this concern that if you don't do the standardized test, other ways to evaluate students might come with their own set of biases. Are you worried about that at all, that you, you wind up successful but still students wind up discriminated against? You know, there's a, d discrimination is a persistent problem in our society, so there's always going to be something to correct, right? However, we know that this test is biased. We know that we have to take corrective measures right now. And, you know, to your point, there are um, almost 40% of private universities have gone test optional or test blind. Okay? And so they have managed to utilize what is what exists in a student's record, such as their strong GPA scores, their social activism, you know, their ranking in, in amongst the rest of their peers, 
to um, to put together um, highly qualified student bodies. So and it sounds like you're saying there is a better way. There Even is if it's a not better a perfect way. way it, a better way. There is a better way, and there is much room. There's always going to re be room for improvement, but this test has to go. Lisa Holder, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And coming up, the case for keeping these exams, that conversation when inside the issues continues. All righty, what is your best guess on this question? The answer is C. And if you got it right, congratulations. You recall a whole lot more about algebra than I do at this particular point in time. Welcome back to Inside the Issues. I'm Alex Cohen. And on this episode, we're talking about standardized tests. And as we've been hearing, there's a lot of concern over whether or not such exams are appropriate for gauging a student's ability to learn. For more on this, we are joined now via Skype by Gretchen Guffey. She's Senior Director of State and Federal policy for ACT. She joins us from Iowa City, Iowa. It's great to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. Uh, as I understand it, when it comes to the ACT exam, uh, roughly 1.8 million students took it last year. Uh, as you see it, what are the benefits? How can standardized tests be helpful when it comes to colleges and universities making their admissions assessments? Sure. So the ACT has been around for more than 60 years. It was created as an assessment uh, to assess students' college and career readiness. And so we believe it's one indicator that students can use to help them uh, set out their uh, college and career path, um, to apply for colleges and universities, to know where their strengths are, um, as well as qualify for scholarship opportunities through using the ACT. We also know it's an opportunity for colleges and universities to assess uh, students and how well they're doing and how well they are uh, college and career ready for, for their particular program. But as, as you know, there are plenty who say, you know what, these tests, they've got a lot of implicit bias in them and it's not really a fair measure of a student's ability, especially for students who might be uh, growing up in low income households, students with disabilities. What would be your response to that? So we, we absolutely do not think that the ACT is the one and only measure that should be used to identify students for a particular program or college. Um, we think that a student should be looked at holistically. In fact, we um, are, are proponents of that. And in addition to using test scores that uh, colleges and universities are also looking at uh, the grade po students' grade point averages, their uh, extracurricular activities, and a whole host of other uh, quali qualifications of a student to, to enter into that, that particular program. Um, but we also uh, want to be clear that, that the ACT is not biased. Um, it's not biased toward any one particular group. Um, we go through great measures uh, to ensure that that bias doesn't exist. We have a list of or a host of internal experts and external uh, validators who review each question before it goes on to the test. Uh, all of our items, the questions are field tested. And if there is determined to be uh, uh, bias within those within those questions, and those tests are, or those questions are removed, and they are never seen on the actual operational assessment that the student takes. Can you maybe give me an example? Because I think you know, in some ways, to hear you say that, like I would like to say that I am without bias and without prejudice, but I'm a human being, right? I think right. we all are, and sometimes it's 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 impractical to think that everyone's going to be perfect about everything that they say and everything that they do. Can you maybe give me a specific example of a question that you came across and how you realized it was wrong and how you went about fixing it? So I, I think a good example would be we would never, for um, for example, we wouldn't um, talk explicitly about uh, football and blitzes and, and football terminology because there are particular subgroups that might understand that 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 terminology or be familiar with football or religious references, for example. And so those are a couple of examples of things that we uh, take care to not um, not write right into those questions. 
But if it does happen, to your point about being a human being, if there is an item, a question that's written, um, that's why we go through all these multiple reviews and stages to ensure that, that there isn't bias when it goes on the actual test. And so it can take us up to a year to actually create an item to ensure that it's valid, predictable, and it's actually measuring what it's supposed to do and that it's not biased. I was looking at the ACT website recently, um, and there is a video about your company. I believe we have it. Let's take a real quick look at that. Okay. Success looks different for everyone. So at ACT, we're improving learning, developing technology, and influencing policy, all to accelerate achievement on your terms. Now, Gretchen, there is this possibility that the UC system here in California, we've already seen other uh, colleges and universities throughout the country uh, not relying on standardized tests anymore. It almost seems to me like maybe your company is anticipating, hey, let's not put all of our eggs in the standardized testing basket. Can you briefly tell us what you're seeing as the future of standardized tests uh, from the ACT perspective? Sure. Well, that's exactly right, Alex. I, I think as an organization, um, our, our core has been measurement and, and assessment, and we think that that's incredibly important and will continue to invest in that. But we also see the learning experience and, and being part of an individual's uh, learning experience and navigating that is critical. And so we we do invest in, in other um, programs and opportunities that are not directly tied to the test, but making sure that um, we're also using our research to provide information and to provide um, opportunities and, and really shine a light on where where we are going as a country, where we think we have strengths and where we have challenges that we really need to address. Gretchen Guffey, who joined us via Skype from Iowa City, Iowa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate it. And up next, we meet a gentleman who aced the SAT, helpful not only for getting into college, but for making a career out of test preparation. We'll hear more about that in just a few moments. Next question, blah, 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 blah. They should be religiously observed, blah, 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 blah. Okay, in that graph, what does the word observed mean? If you selected A, you're absolutely right. If you needed help, well, then you might want to call Tam Lee. Back in high school, Lee scored an exceptionally rare 99 percentile on his SAT, which makes him uniquely qualified to teach others how to ace the test. Our Ariel Wessler caught up with him in Woodland Hills. Let's pick a random math question and we'll just kind of work through it. These days, Tam Lee helps others take tests, but he still remembers what it was like to be on the other side of the desk. I was always a good test taker, so I thought this was a, a good route to go. Good to say the least. He scored in the top 1% on his SATs, and after graduating from UCLA with a degree in biology, he decided he would make test prep his career. So 15% is how much? He now runs ACE at test prep and tutoring in Woodland Hills. I came from a, a lower income family and I spent a lot of time studying. A lot of different families can do that too, right? Um, I think tutoring is just a great way of helping. The company offers one-on-one -on -one tutoring that ranges from $60 to $200 an hour, depending on the tutor's experience. Tam says most kids sign up for five lessons per test and each session runs about 90 minutes. Our average increase is about 150 to 250 points for the SATs uh, and the ACTs is about six points. Like, what strategy would this be? He says tutors can provide strategies and techniques to help students with the tests, but ultimately it's about how much effort the student devotes to studying. Good job. One plus one equals two, but they'll see that in the test and go, no way, and they'll pick 11. Simple answer is the best answer. Do not overthink. Though SAT and ACT prep is the bread and butter of his business, he also feels it's a necessary part of the college admissions process. This is called a standardized test because it's an even playing field. Everyone gets the same questions um, from California to New York. Some supporters also argue the tests act as a check against grade inflation. They also give students who struggled in the classroom another chance to show they can be academically successful. I'm not saying that everyone who spends a lot of time can do well, but I think it's an excuse to say that only the high income students can do well.
Mehar Rostogi is a junior at El Camino High School in Woodland Hills and has her sights set on UC Santa Barbara. I'm pretty weak at like math. She says a lot of her friends come here too. She's taken the PSAT three times and credits tutoring for boosting her score more than 100 points. She is now preparing for her big SAT in March. It's definitely not like a measure of anyone's like intelligence and it doesn't measure like creativity at all, which is probably really important. All this stuff like a computer can do. And with more competition, the pressure to do well is higher than ever. There's definitely parents that say, hey, I want this exact score and what score do we need to get to and there's no other way. Uh, but I think parents need to realize there's many different factors. He says most colleges and universities prefer well-rounded students, leaders both in and out of the classroom. It really means a lot that I get to take a part of this journey that students have uh, in their educational lives. And as long as these tests exist... So, number 12, do you remember what kind of strategy we would work on with this one? Tam's goal remains the same, to help each student reach their own. And Ariel joins us now uh, as a parent, 60 to $200 an hour. Clearly, we are in the wrong industry, Ariel. <laughs> yes, exactly. What other options are out there for families that really can't afford that? So there are a lot of free options. There's the Khan Academy, which is mm. pretty popular. That's run by the College Board. That is free online. YouTube videos. Tam says these days you can pretty much Google any of the questions, get answers right there, you know, on Google that you can write down and figure out how you got to that answer. The College yeah. Board offers free exams uh, online as well on their website. I saw Groupon just the other day for free online SAT uh, of courses. Of course you did. And, you know, so some and people, it looks like students are using this, especially in California, where above average for the SAT and the SAT and ACT as far as how students do. Um, for the SAT, it's like five points higher than the national average. The ACT were a couple points. Uh, 22, well, I was looking here, it was like 22.6 point, point versus 20.7. Wow, how do you so. do on your standardized test? I bet you did well, didn't you? Oh my you? goodness, uh, no, not, I, did, <laughs> I, I had low SAT scores, honestly. Uh, my GPA, I think, was able to, to carry me, but. You did all right. So I, I'm yeah, not too it, worried it about it. Ari Wessler, thank you so much for joining us. And finally, it's the essay portion of this episode, so to speak. It's time to think big thoughts about the future of admissions. We'll have more on that in just a few moments. A party of four, two men and two women, came into the restaurant all talking at once and took possession of the center table near a slimy Lime Mary's. Primary impression of the party of four is that they... Answer is A, noisy and distracting. But really? Are you sure about that? I mean, I don't know. If they're all talking at once about really interesting things and they're cool people, maybe she did find them a refreshing change or that they represent glamour and youth. Ah, these questions. Anyway, to round out our show on standardized testing, I'm joined now by a party of three. One man, two women. They are starting on my right. Ashley Nguyen, Associate Director of Admissions at Pepperdine University. Jason Weingarten, who is currently a college admissions officer with the group Ivy Coach. And finally, we have Robin Hamilton, Associate Dean of Admissions at Oxy. It is great to have all of you here, and I'm just going to leap right into it. Standardized tests, best thing about them for you as an admissions officer. Robin, go. Best thing about them. It yeah. gives us something that everyone has. It's something that we require, but it is also just one part of our process. Yeah. So, as we look through applications, being at a place like Occidental where we have the time to give personal attention, we can look at grades, we can look at test scores, but we also look at everything else they do, everything else that makes them who they are. And yeah. so while it's great to have a standardized piece, we do know that it's only one part. It's a litmus test, it though. Is. Everyone's taking the same test. All right, Jason, we should mention your former admissions officer uh, at Pennsylvania University. Uh, in all of this, what do you think is the most compelling argument to keep these tests? Well, I think just that it's one piece, still an important piece, still a piece that colleges are using to yeah. evaluate students, but at the same time, it's a piece that is one of many. And so even in the wake of a colleges maybe going towards test optional or going the way of being text flexible, that doesn't mean that it's their test unimportant. They still are important parts that are used yeah. to evaluate students. Yeah. Uh, Ashley, I'm going to, because I have a feeling you disagree with anything they're saying? No. No. Okay, so let's move to the drawbacks of these tests. When you're sitting there and you're looking at all of these applications and essays and reference letters and all the rest of it, what gives you concern when you look at a standardized test score? Sure. I think the hardest thing is trying to contextualize, right? So we know that students come from different backgrounds, and so just making sure that we are giving 
credit to the student uh, and really placing them in their context, in their high school setting, in their local setting, and then looking at the national grain as well. Yeah. So how do you do that? And maybe we could hear from you. You know, you're sitting there. I can't even imagine mm -hmm. your job because you are evaluating a human being's life, but you're doing so. I mean, in my day, I, I, it was paper. I'm dating myself. But, you know, it's all digitally now. So, you know, Robin, talk to me about that, right? You're looking at how this kid looks great. Look at this SAT score. What do you, what do, you do when yeah. you don't... Yeah, well, we're trying to create a narrative and we're looking for the different pieces to really add up and tell us how prepared the student is to be successful in an Oxy classroom. That's obviously ultimately the bottom line. Are they going to be successful? Are they going to be able to keep up? Have they taken the classes and built the habits that are going to prepare them for that? And so if we see a test score that is particularly low, we're going to then look through the rest of the application. Do we see that their writing is particularly well done or is it also maybe underperforming? Are their, mm -hmm. are their GPA or the classes that they've chosen to take? Academic rigor is a really important part. Um, of the preparation process as well. Are they taking classes and doing well and work that will mimic what they're going to be asked to do here on campus? And yeah. so if we're seeing all these data points that maybe contradict a test score, then we're going to probably give it less merit in the process and saying that in all these other ways that student is really prepared to be successful here, that test score might be an outlier for a variety of reasons and yeah. um, demographics that may impact their abilities. Well, and it's that inherent bias part of it that I think really gives, you know, pause for a lot of folks. And we heard uh, Gretchen Guffey of the AC CT say before, you know, we've got all these methods and commissions and we take out and we are not biased. I'm just curious when you hear something, <laughs> you all are laughing. But you know, I mean, is that even, is it even thinkable to think we have a non-biased test? I mean, I think what the literature says is that no, I mean, yeah. it, is a, it is biased and that there is plenty of data to back that up. And yeah. so that is something that we have to work through as an admission office, again, to contextualize and, and to really help understand then what is kind of, what are we providing that merit to and where should we be looking to see where the students academic qualifications are coming from? Yeah, so Jason, talk to me as a current admissions coach, you work with mm -hmm. this group Ivy coach and a family comes in and they say, okay, you know, we really want our kid to go to this college or this university. What is the spiel that you give to them about how much weight, how much value to give to these standardized tests? So I think the important thing to recognize is that even though the ACT and the College Board, the makers of the SAT, say that they are there for the students and that they want to see students succeed, at the end of the day, they are nonprofits, but they do care about their bottom line. Yeah. And they are going to try to do what they can to make sure that they get more students taking these tests and that they're able to grow on their either billion dollar revenue or multiple hundred million dollar revenues. And so they say one thing, but they don't necessarily do the other. It's important that families realize that. And we see ourselves at Ivy Coach as providing that demystification of the college admissions process and really showing a lot of logic and shining a lot of spotlight and sunlight onto this for families. Yeah, but then what do we do with all of this? Because I feel like this is kind of right back where we started when I talked with Teresa Wantanabe at the beginning of this show. You know, this test isn't perfect, but it's the test that we've got. It's the test we've been using now for, you know, almost a century. So Robin, what do you see as the path forward on this, especially from your perspective as an admissions officer? I mean, I think those institutions that continue to use the test have to be really thoughtful and be really nuanced about it to make sure that they're including it as only one part of the admission process. And also really recognizing that there's not only the test, but a variety of pretty inequitable inputs that come into our process. As we've heard throughout the show, there's lots of issues. So we think about K-12, we think about pre-K. Um, students are being disadvantaged throughout the process. And so yeah. understanding that we have this one snapshot in time of a student's sort of educational journey, how do we make that process as equitable as possible, whether we're using tests or not. It is fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I really, you all have tough work. I will be <laughs> thinking about you as I apply for college with my kids in the future. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for coming by. And we've got some final thoughts when Inside the Issues continues. Don't go away.
Did you find this evening's episode A, interesting, B, informative, C, entertaining, D, all of the above? There is no right answer, but we always value your opinion. There are a number of ways to get in touch. You can do so on Twitter. We are at Issues on One. I am there as well, at Alex Cohen in L.A. Email address is inside the issues at charter.com. So put down your number two pencils and send us your feedback.